Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> so glad you guys are awake with me here. Uh, hey, we're super excited that you guys are here. My name is Stephen. I'm so glad to be up here. Uh, last week, Pastor started a, a new sermon series called Sacred Rhythms. And Sacred Rhythms is all about uh, intentionally putting different rhythms in our lives that bring us closer not only to God, but closer to the plan and the calling that God has placed for each and every one of us. So we're continuing that uh, here this morning in Sacred Rhythms. But I want to ask you a question um, that, uh, yeah, before we get into this, something I have to ask myself and something I want to ask you and for you to process is, have you ever felt like in your life that your life is moving at such a pace where it's pushing you farther and farther and farther away from the people that you love and care about the most. That you're running at a pace that you can't keep up and maybe you're even spending time with them. Like you're spending countless hours with them. It's not that you're not with them, um, but you're not taking the opportunities to slow down, to be able to process and get to know these people and for them to truly know you. Because how many of you guys know that there is a difference between knowing someone and truly knowing someone? So how many of us feel like we're in this, this moment or this phase where we're, we're going at a speed where we can't truly connect and love the people that, that we love the most? Or, even worse, have you ever felt like you're moving at such a pace you don't even know where God is bringing you right now? The future seems kind of distant and hazy and you don't have time to stop and think about what is God calling me to? Because we're rushing at a pace that we can't get, keep up. And how many, how many of you guys know that when you rush into something and try to do something and rush in without taking your time, sometimes it can be damaging, right? Sometimes when you try not to you know, slow down, it can be damaging, whatever it is. And, and there was one time in particular for me where I work part-time as an electrician in my dad's business. And uh, quite a few years ago, me and my dad were at a house and our job for the day was we were replacing a panel box in this homeowner's house taking out the panel box, and if you've ever done this before, you know that in order to take out this panel box and replace the panel box in somebody's house, you need rg and to shut off the power so you can work on it. For whatever reason, some of you are like, I know where this is going already here. <laughs> For whatever reason, we were in a hurry that day, we were rushing, and rg and &E was late. If you know anything about me and my dad, then we're not really good at waiting on people. So, for whatever reason, bad idea, we decided to change out this panel box without rg &E turning off the power. Bad idea number one of the day. So we go in, and in this old house, in the old houses, they have a panel box uh, to the right, and to the left, there is an, a meter box. And if you pull out the meter, the thing that uh, gauges how much electric you're using, if you pull that out, your panel box is dead. So we can work on the panel box as long as I'm careful and I don't touch the meter box to the left until rg &E gets here. Foolproof plan, right guys? Foolproof plan. So here I am, I, I'm taking out this panel box and I'm moving, I'm not paying attention, I'm rushing and I pull out a wire, one of the bare copper wires hits this meter box and explodes right in my face. And it wasn't just once and it was done, it got so hot that the wire melted onto the meter and stuck there and for about 30 seconds straight was just popping on and off right in my face. So I'm freaking out. I, was, I did not handle it well, I'll say that. So I'm scared out of my mind. And in those moments, you don't think straight, guys, I'm telling you. So I, I'm freaking out. But I, I finally get the sense, like, this is not good to have. And then behind me, I can hear something else popping too. I was like, I don't have time to worry about that. So I finally get the sense, I get my screwdriver, I pop the wire off of the meter box, it stops. But I still hear, like, this hissing noise. And I turn around, and the entire basement is filled with smoke. I'm like, oh, shoot, like, that's not good. <laughs> so, so I hope nobody notices, right? Like, so I go around, and, and I go investigate the problem in the basement, and there's water spraying everywhere. I'm like, I'm no dummy, but I'm pretty sure I was not working on the water line at this time. So the water's spraying everywhere. The, the basement is filled with smoke. And when I found out what happened later, so I finally shut off the water to get to stop. I found out what happened is when I hit that wire onto the meter box, it sent power to the wrong side of a light fixture that happened to be sitting on top of a metal water pipe and it exploded and sent water everywhere. Dad was not happy. Uh, <laughs> I got a stern talking to afterwards. 
Um, so dad wasn't happy. I finally shut off the, po- or the water. We were able to uh, not only fix the electrical problem, but now we had to pay to fix a plumber to come out and fix this poor lady's pipes that we just exploded. And how many of you know that anytime you rush into something in any area of life, you try to not take your time, you usually leave things more damaged than the way that you found it. And that's true in a lot of areas of our life. And I think Jesus actually pinpoints this exact problem in, in, our, in our life. And I think he has actually a lot to say about the specific rushing and taking, not taking your time in certain things. And we're going to read a, a story. This is found in Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 34. And quickly, the context of this story the disciples just got back from a short term mission trip that Jesus just sent them on. They were teaching performing miracles. They were telling people about Jesus and who he was. It was a really, really awesome time of ministry for them. Then also during this time, we find out that John the Baptist was just killed, their close friend. So it was a fruitful, exciting time of ministry, but it was also emotionally draining and a difficult time. So Jesus takes them and he says, okay, we're going to go off by ourselves. And he takes his disciples without anyone else. They get into a boat by themselves solely for the purpose of resting by themselves without doing anything else. And it's just Jesus and the disciples that get into this boat. And they travel across this lake. And once they get to the other side, after resting, they get up to the shore. And there are thousands of people waiting for them. Thousands. I don't know about you, nobody's been that excited to see me where there's more than like two, my dog gets really excited to see me when I get home, and that's probably about it, my wife sometimes, like, no, I'm just kidding, she loves me, but I've never had thousands of people come to wait, and they get off on the shore, and there's hundreds of thousands, not hundreds of thousands, but thousands of people waiting for them, waiting for Jesus, so they get down, and this is where we pick up, this is found in, uh, in verse 34, it says this, When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time, it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it is already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take more than a half year's wages. Are we to spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? They're saying here, Jesus, you don't pay us enough. Hint, hint. How many loaves do we have, he asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them all all the people to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in the groups of hundreds and fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up the 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was 5,000. So Jesus gets done teaching this huge group of people, and the disciples immediately want to send them home. Like, we're done here. We've accomplished what we need to do. We're going to rush them home because here's the deal. We're hungry. We want to go get something to eat, and we can't feed these people. So send them home. Let them worry about how they're going to get fed. Let them worry about how they're going to get taken care of so we can get home, and we need to worry about the next thing. What's next, Jesus? Where are we moving next? Um, And where do we have to get to after this? And they wanted to rush this huge crowd of people home. And Jesus says, no. He says, it's our responsibility to take care of them. So he says, find the food that we have, and they find the small amount of food, and he performs this crazy, miraculous miracle and divides up all of this food and not only feeds thousands of people, but it says there's leftovers, basketfuls of leftovers upon leftovers. It's like after Thanksgiving, like where you just eat Thanksgiving dinner for like a month straight because you just got leftovers afterwards. This is what's happening here. And they feed all of these people. So this story, it starts with rest. They go off into the boat by themselves to get by themselves, to rest and to recuperate together, to be together. Then they find this hectic, crazy mosh pit of people coming and waiting for them. They do this awesome ministry in front of them. And then afterwards, if we were to continue reading a few verses later, they go off to a mountain by themselves to pray again to rest. So it starts with rest and it ends with rest. And I think we all know the importance of rest, right? 
Like whether we practice it or not, or actually rest and slow down and take a break, like that's a different story. But all of us at least logically understand the importance of rest. Like you can only run for so, so long. You can only be in, a, you know, in, in your workplace for so long. You can only have your mind focused on one thing for so long before you need to take a break. We get that. We understand that. Whether we practice that or not, it's a different story. But we all understand you can only go for so long before you need to take a break. And Jesus is modeling and teaching this idea of rest right before his disciples. But he's pressing in something deeper about rest. He's pressing in something more that we don't initially always understand or even practice at all that Jesus is trying to show us and show his disciples. What if rest was not limited to us taking our time to be away from people without any other activity? What if rest was more than just that? It is that. But what if rest also included slowing down when you're with other people? What if rest also included slowing down with other people? We have a hard time slowing down with people, don't we? We have a really hard time doing that, especially in our culture and our age. It's difficult to, uh, to truly sit and to be present with someone sometimes. I am the worst at this. My, my mind moves a billion miles an hour. If I'm not like focused in for more than 30 seconds, like I get distracted easily and my mind will move into the next thing. It is difficult sometimes to sit and truly be with someone. We're not very good at this. We'll, we'll, we'll go to the same times, we'll, we'll go to the same coffee shop every single day for years on end, the same kids serving us coffee, and we don't even know their name because we're just too busy getting our coffee. Sometimes we'll mow our lawns and we won't even meet our, or talk to our neighbors because that lawn's not gonna mow itself and who knows when it's gonna rain again. We're not good at slowing down with people. We'll cut our kids off when they're, when they're sharing a story because they're rambling on and I have more important things that I need to think about, talk about, whatever, and we'll rush past the people that we love the most. This is not an easy thing for us, but could you imagine for a moment what this story would have looked like had Jesus rushed past this group of people? What would have happened if Jesus said, you know what, I gotta be at the mountain at 7.45 p.m. sharp, like, uh, go home, we'll see you next week, hope you took notes, remember it, do your homework, whatever, we'll see you again later, and he left. Could you imagine of the people that he would have missed out on? The crowd would have just been a crowd. There would have been no individual person in that crowd. It just would have been a crowd. Real people would have been ignored. Real life, real problems would have been missed. And even worse, the disciples would have missed out on an opportunity to be a participant in the calling and the work of God in their lives. Not just a spectator or something. They were participating in something that God was doing, and they would have missed out on that had they rushed past. And even worse, these people would have had limited access to the grace and truth that only Jesus can offer. What would have been the cost if Jesus rushed past these people? What would have been the cost if Jesus rushed past me and rushed past you? How much different would our lives be? Look, and here's what I think Jesus is trying to get us to understand and what he's trying to teach and actively show these disciples is we need to slow down with people in order to love people. We need to slow down with people in order to love people. What if the first step for you fulfilling your calling in your life that God has placed on you was the activity of slowing down with the people that you're, you're with? What if the first step in you uh, practicing what God has for you and, and experiencing everything that God has placed over your life was you slowing down with the very people that God has already entrusted with you? What if that was the first spiritual discipline or sacred rhythm that God is trying to get us to understand, to practice, and to live out on a daily basis, to slow down with people? What would our families look like if we not only just took time to spend with them, but if we truly invested in them 
and built them up and encouraged them? What would our neighbors look like if we took the time to build a relationship with them and allow them to access a family full of grace and truth where, where Jesus has changed their lives? What would our workplaces look like if our employees and our coworkers, we knew who they were and we were able to pray over them, pray over their problems and the things that are happening in our life? What would our culture look like if we were able to slow down with people? How much would be different than the way it is now if we took the time to truly slow down with people? Because we can't properly love people if we're rushing past them. I think Jesus is saying we need to slow down with people in order to love people. But usually, all of these opportunities get missed. And the opportunity for us to be a participant in something that God is doing, and not just coming to church and just kind of observing what God is doing, but be participating, having God work through you in some way, those opportunities usually get missed, not because we're too busy. A lot of us have busy schedules. I think if I were to ask you guys, who here is not busy? We'd have five people raise their hand. Everyone is busy. And I think being busy is a good thing. I think working hard is a good thing. Getting things done is a good thing. But I think God and Jesus is trying to challenge us here. What if you could slow down in the middle of your busy season to be with people? How many opportunities get missed because we're not slowing down? We need to slow down with people in order to love people. So what causes us to do that? Like what inside of my brain like wants to just move on to the next thing right after I get done talking to someone for like 20 seconds? What inside of me wants to be able to move on to something else? What inside of me wants to uh, decide that the people that I'm with, I I can't stay with here, or I I have to move on to the next thing, or I can't take time to build a relationship with this person? What inside of us causes that to happen where where we will rush past people? And how can we ensure that we are living out the life that God has really called us to live? How can we make sure that we we can uh, continue doing that? And I think I want to point out two things here. And I think these are things that Jesus recognizes in the story that he's trying to show us. He's trying to show his disciples. So I want to point out two things. And number one is this. Remember people's value. Remember people's value. Verse 34 says that Jesus looks into the crowd and he has compassion on them. Have you ever like sat and just watched like you went to a mall or movie theater or baseball game or something and just looked at the crowd of people and not in like a condescending way, but like in a way you just see all these people and your heart just breaks for them because they're chasing off after something that just can't fulfill them. You ever have that happen? Jesus sits and he looks at this crowd and he says, they're sheep without a shepherd. They're traveling and they're going after things that can't fulfill them, can't save them, can't forgive them, can't bring them joy or purpose in their lives. And not only that, some of the things they're running after are gonna bring more darkness and pain and destruction in their lives. And Jesus' heart breaks for them and he looks at this crowd of thousands of people and he sees an individual. He sees individuals made in the image of God. C.S. Lewis says this, there are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, and arts, civilizations, these are mortal, and their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. How often... Do we forget that the people that we come in contact with every single day are made in the image of God? Not just the people we like, the people that annoy us too. (laughs) They're made in the image of God. They're sheep without a shepherd, and some of them, they don't even know or understand the grace and the truth of God yet. They're still living a life where they're going after something that's worthless, that's only going to bring them more pain and never fulfill, or even worse, never save them. They're made in the image of God, and because of that, they have value. The disciples in this story, they weren't thinking about these people's values, right? Like, they were getting hangry, and they wanted to go eat something afterwards. They didn't have to worry. They didn't want to have to worry about this huge crowd of people. They wanted to move on to the next thing. They were looking at these people as if they were a crowd. When Jesus looked at them as an individual and said, you and these people have value, and because of that, I need to slow down to be with them 
to serve them, to love them. Because they have value. What if we slowed down when we were with people? How much more could we love them? What if we slowed down? Number two, remember your provision. Remember your provision. Disciples in this story, they were under the assumption that they were going to have to provide food for these people, which is logical, right? It's either they eat here, we feed them, or we send them away, they go get their own food. And here's the deal. Like, I don't have enough money to feed them. My kitchen's not big enough to cook for them all. Like, we're going to have to send them away. So they said, Jesus, we're going to send them away. Let them go get their food on their own. And Jesus says, no, it's our responsibility to take care for them. And the disciples were under the assumption that they were the ones who were going to have to provide everything for these people. How often do we feel like we are the sole providers for our life? That we bear the, fi- the full weight and load of the provision in our life. As much as we think or we try to trick ourselves into thinking that I earn this, I get this stuff, I uh, uh, consume this stuff, and I provide for myself. Do we know that God is the ultimate provision for our life? That it's, it's not up to us to bear the weight of all of that. And Jesus says, you don't understand. I will do this for you. I will provide this for you and for these people. Because it's not your responsibility, and you never could provide everything for yourself and for these people. And because of that, Jesus says, we're going to provide for them. Sometimes we'll try to rush and go all different angles and try so many different things. We'll work countless hours. We'll take on extra things because we're anxious about what tomorrow will bring. We're anxious about what the future might have. We're afraid we don't have enough. So we'll, we'll put all of these things on our plates at the expense of our families and the ones that we love because we feel like we have to provide something for ourselves that we have no business being able to provide for. And here's what I'm saying. I am not against hard work. I think hard work is a good thing. And if you're not working hard, I don't think, I don't think that's what God has intended for you. But I think we're fooling ourselves if we think we're the sole providers for our faith and for our future and for our families. God is saying, are you going to trust me to provide for you? Remember our provision. So we know the damage that this can cause if we don't slow down with people, right? Like we know what can happen. We know the areas that we can go as people if we're not with them. So what could, so if you're here like, okay, that makes sense. So how would I know if that is something in my life that, that I, I'm not good at, that I'm not doing? Most of us can kind of usually self-assess. But if you're like, hey, I don't know. Like how do I know if this is something I need areas of, of uh, working? And here's what I have found true for my life that I know have been uh, areas or indicators that I know I'm not slowing down with people when I should. So if you're struggling with the idea or even just consciously or subconsciously valuing people, it could look like this. Maybe we won't talk or build relationships with people who won't elevate our social status or opportunities. Maybe we won't build relationships with people who can't give us anything back. We won't invite them to dinner because I'm not sure if they'll invite us back. I'm not inviting them to my wedding or to our party because I'm not sure if they'll ever invite us back. I'm not going to sacrifice something of myself if it's going to cost me something and I'll never get anything in return because I don't feel like these people are worth that. Or when we have someone or something that we disagree with, instead of going and building a relationship or having a conversation with them about whatever it is and valuing them as a person and respecting them, we'll throw a quick jab out on social media and rant on social media about a political issue or something else that's going on because we don't want to take the time to invest and value someone else's opinion and to build a relationship with them. So we'll get a cheap shot in on social media. Or maybe we're having trouble with the idea of providing for ourselves, or understanding where our provision comes from. Maybe for you, that does look like you're working countless hours, and even more than you need. I understand the idea that if, you can't, if you're trying to make ends meet, that's one thing, but maybe more than you need because you want to achieve success, you want to be great, you want to be known as somebody who's made it to the top, so you'll put that at the top at the expense of the family and your loved ones because you're trying to earn something or a title for yourself because you like to achieve 
Or maybe you so desperately want your kids to succeed. And that's a good thing. But you so desperately want them to have every opportunity available so you'll sign them up for sport after sport after sport, musical after musical, recital after recital, and involve them in so many things because you want them to have as many opportunities as possible, but in the meantime, they are disconnected from families of faith, they're disconnected from people growing together in a community of faith because you don't trust God enough to provide those opportunities for them. Do we understand that we are not the ones who have to provide everything for ourselves and for our people. So we will rush past people. We will rush past the people who are most important to us, even the people we don't know yet, because we feel like either A, they're not truly valuable enough for my time, or B, I have things I have to get done. I need things I need to provide for myself and others, so I'm not gonna take the time out to do that. So what's our solution? (laughs) Because that's bad news, right? That's rough sauce, as the kids would say. Nobody says that. I say that. I get laughed at, but that's okay. So what is our solution? And here's, here's what I think could be really uh, terrible for us. We would be fools to think, all right, cool, I understand. Like, I just have to remember people's value better. I have to try really hard at remembering where my provision comes from, and then I'll be all set, and then I'll slow down with people, and I'll be able to take time for people. And here's what I, I, think, I think is true here, is the problem of slowing down with people in order to love them, that's not the problem. That is a side effect of a deeper-rooted issue. So if you're sitting here trying to uh, outdo yourself and even put different things in place to slow down with people, you may succeed in some areas, but the deep-rooted issue of your heart is still going to be left the same, and ultimately, your problems are not going to be taken care of. So what is the problem, and then what is the solution? And uh, bear with me here. This may sound crazy, but I think the ultimate problem to this is that we have forgotten the gospel. And you're like, I go to church every single Sunday, like, I remember, I don't think I've forgotten the gospel, but bear with me here. Let me, let me explain kind of some of my, my thoughts on this here. The gospel tells us that we are all broken and messed up sinners, right? We are all broken and messed up sinners, and no matter what we could do, we could never earn our way back to God. And we don't deserve his grace, we don't deserve his love, we don't deserve his forgiveness. But God loved us so much that he would send his son, Jesus, not because we did anything to earn it, but because we were made in the image of God, and because of that, we held value, and because of that value, Jesus says, that is worth me dying for you because of the value that you carry, and then when he does die for us, he gives us even more value by giving us, uh, calling us kings, uh, or I'm sorry, calling us children of his, of his kingdom. We didn't do anything to deserve it, but we hold value because we are made in the image of God and we hold value because Jesus died for us. And if we hold value and if God values us, don't you think that God values the kid at the Starbucks who just messed up your order? Don't you think God values our neighbors, our coworkers, our friends, our families, the uncle who's always really weird at Thanksgiving time? And if God values them, Don't you think we should too? The gospel also tells us that no matter how much we try, we cannot provide enough good things to be made right with God. We can't provide enough good works uh, to be loved by him, forgiven by him, accepted by him, to be part of his family. We can't do it. And we try sometimes, but we can never provide enough for that. But that's okay because God provided his son, his perfect and holy son, to die in our place so that we can trust on his provision to be able to be forgiven by him and to be brought into his family. It is all on his provision and not ours. And guys, if God is willing to provide enough to save our souls, why do we still feel like we are the sole providers of every other area of our life? Do we trust in God's provision? I think ultimately we have forgotten the gospel. So in those times where we're rushed, we don't want to take time for people. We don't want to recognize people or build something with people or even share the grace or truth with someone that we know. We again have to remind ourselves and allow the Holy Spirit to work on our hearts and remind us again and again and again the truth of the gospel and what it means for us and what it means for them. 
because people are way too valuable to not slow down for them. We are too valuable because of God to not be a participant in what he's doing. God wants to be able to use us. God wants to be able to show you how awesome he is. He wants to be able to use you to be able to transform your workplaces, your families, your neighborhoods, and we get to be an active participant in that if we choose to allow God uh, to um, transform us so we can slow down with the people that we are with. We are missing out on opportunities to be part of something so much bigger than ourselves. What would it look like if we slowed down with people in order to love people. And ultimately, we can get to that point when we remember, people are so valued by God. I don't have to worry about what happens next. I know God is is already in charge and he's already watching over me. He's providing for me. And the gospel says that that's true. So what would it look like for you to slow down with people in order to love people? going to have everyone actually just kind of bow your heads, close your eyes. We're going to pray in a second here. But I want everyone to kind of reflect on this, on this thought here. And um, so maybe you're here and you're like, hey, this is a, something that's challenging for me, but I understand the importance of what the gospel says. I understand that. I get that. And I'm ready. I want to take, uh, I want to take this to the next step because I do believe that people are too valuable to be ignored or to rush past. So how do I practically now start taking steps to be able to slow down with people? And I want to offer out this challenge to everyone because it sure is a challenge for me here, something that I struggle with and I want to be able to uh, do as well, but I'm going to challenge everyone else too, is this. Who is one person or family in your life that you could just invite over for dinner and just slow down and be with them, start building relationships? Or, which I would encourage, more importantly, who is one person or family that you could invite over for dinner who doesn't know Jesus? It doesn't have to be like a weird time where you just preach to them and try to get them you know, you know, saved and everything like that right in that moment. But maybe you just start building a relationship with them And over time, they start to see and you start to share with them some of the grace and the truth that God has showed to you and the redemption that he has brought in your life. So what would it look like if we at a church just decide to slow down with people in that way? Maybe you're in this room and you're feeling like, hey, uh, this sounds great, but I have a really hard time even valuing myself and I have a really hard time feeling like I can even provide enough for God because I feel like I, I couldn't, I'm not valuable enough to be loved by him. So we have this idea that because I'm such a messed up person, I've done so many dumb things in my life, I cannot, I don't have anything to offer God. So I doubt he could truly not only love me, that's one thing, but I don't even think he could actually use me in a way that could be spectacular. And here's, here's what I'll say. Half part, you're right. Half part, you're wrong. That sounds a little discouraging. Here's what I'll tell you. You are right in the sense that you can do nothing to earn God's love. You can't offer anything to be made right by him. You have nothing that you can give of yourself to be able to do anything to earn that acceptance, forgiveness, or love, or purpose in your life. Bad news. Rough day. Here's the good news. That's the point. You hold a unique value because who God created you to be. You hold value because you were created by God for God. And it doesn't matter if you've messed up in unimaginable, unspeakable ways. You hold value in your heart, in your life, in who you are because of who God tells you that you are. So because of that, he sent his son to die for you. The God of the universe came down in the flesh and said, I'm going to give my life for you because you hold that much value. The next steps for you is maybe maybe the next steps for you is to say, you know what, I'm ready to surrender everything I have to him. I'm ready to give my heart to him. I'm ready to accept the, the path that he has for me. Not because I'm good enough, I could never be good enough, but because I know I hold value in him and he loves me so deeply that he would die for me. And if that is you, I would encourage you, start that conversation and relationship with God and start asking God, how can I start to live my life for you now? Because of what he's done for you. Jesus, we're so grateful for who you are. 
We hold a value that we don't deserve. We're loved by you and we don't deserve it. And in fact, we've done everything in our power to just not deserve it. But God, you've died and you've loved us and you've given us a purpose. God, we want to be a part of what you're doing. We don't want to just sit by and see it happen. We want to be a part of your plan and your purpose and calling. God, will you allow us to transform us to be the type of people that slow down when we're with others? Can we be a church that's not known for how good it can be or how, how awesome its people are or how righteous our people are or even how cool our new building may be? We're, we don't want to be known by that, God. We want to be known as people who truly take the time to sit and love people and spend time to know them and invest in them and share the grace and truth that you have given us. Will you transform us into those people? We praise you in your name. Amen. Will you guys join and stand me?